Good afternoon and welcome to Lend Account Global Edition. And this week we have with us Philip Carter and he will be speaking on the many paths to functional programming and language adoption. Philip, thank you for being with us today and we are really excited for this talk, so. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I'm definitely, uh, you know, I'm a little bummed that we can't do LambdaConf in person again because it was so great last year. It was actually my first year and so I was looking forward to it again, but I think COVID is a pretty good excuse to not be uh, together physically. So, um, yeah. So, uh, hey everybody, my name is Philip Carter. I work at Microsoft on the .NET compilers and tools team. Uh, and for the past four years or so, I've been working a lot on F Sharp, um, one of the functional languages that I'll be mentioning throughout this talk. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work with language design and implementation, uh, the evolution of our compilers, uh, building and evolving our tools inside of Visual Studio and helping other people do that in other editors. And I've also been doing um, some, I've sort of recently been taking on uh, maintainer duties for some libraries in the F-Sharp ecosystem. Uh, and also, I've been lucky to have my employer pay for me to go to various conferences uh, a couple times a year to talk to other functional programming communities and also other communities that don't do FP and uh, try to evangelize F Sharp. And it's actually that, that last bit that I want to draw from um, the most in, in this talk because um, it's not, this isn't going to be that like very technical. There may be a few technical topics that I sort of discuss, but um, I, I don't think we lack for technical content in functional programming communities. And I think there are, uh, you know, other people in, in uh, different languages who are probably a bit, um, probably a bit better at some, some of the more advanced, you know, really awesome stuff than I am. Uh, so I'd like to talk a little bit more about functional programming language adoption, which is something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, not just because it, you know I, I also do it for my job, but you know, it's something that I, I care a lot about because uh, I'm, I'm definitely, I've, I've drunk the Kool-Aid, I believe in functional programming, um, and I wanna see more people use it. But I don't, there's not a whole lot of people that use it, and uh, I'd like to talk about some things that I think we might be able to try uh, you know, across the different communities and, and see what we can do to help move the needle there, so. Um, First, I'd like to frame things up a bit in terms of adoption. Um, and by that, I, I think we have a problem. Uh, and the, you know, I think there's many ways that you can look at this problem, but I think looking at stack overflow tag trends is probably one of the best ways to do this. Uh, if we look at the relative share of FP languages over time, and I, there's, there's maybe some more that I could have included here, but uh, there's two things that I think are worth calling out here. Um, the first is that the relative um, share over time is declining or is flat for pretty much every language on the right hand side. And if you look at the y axis, everything is objectively small. Um, Scala, which is, I think most people would agree, the most popular functional programming language, or at least the most popular language you do a lot of functional programming in, uh, hasn't even reached 1% of the total share, which is, that's tiny. Um, if we include Rust, which I know that some people in, in FP land don't think it's a functional language. Um, I do. I, I think it has very strong roots from, from FP. That one's growing, which is good, but I mean, 0.2%, that's a pretty small share if you ask me. Um, if we look at some languages that uh, do, you know, source a lot of their features from functional programming languages, like, you know, these more modern languages like Swift and, and Kotlin. Um, you know, it, it gets a bit bigger, but, you know, Swift is sort of stabilizing, Kotlin eh, may be growing, maybe stable. There, there's probably not enough time or data to really sort of indicate a trend for Kotlin yet. It's still pretty small, though, um, because if we look at how these compare for tags in Stack Overflow compared to mainstream languages, a lot of what we use is barely even registering as a blip on this graph. And so you might say, okay, well, this one graph is bad, but you know, surely there's, there's FP usage elsewhere. I'm like, yeah, yeah, there is. Stack Overflow is not the only signal in the world. But I think it's a very important one because it, what this ultimately represents is people who are active in a language and asking questions about it because they're trying to do something concrete. Um, 
I watch the F sharp tag and I answer a decent amount of those questions. And so I know for a fact that like F sharp is like this flat little blip in there and like we are getting questions. So it's not like every single question about the language has been asked and answered. Um, we're still getting them because you know the language is evolving. There's questions that people have about things. But um, if you compare that to the amount of people asking questions about Python and JavaScript and even uh, C sharp and Java, which you know whose share is declining over time, it's it's minuscule and it's diminishing even further. So I kind of view that as a problem, uh, and I think that's that that might be a good thing to acknowledge if if you care about adoption like I do. Um, and so I think sort of I, I want to sort of establish table stakes here, but just saying that FP languages are a niche, and you know we we have wonderful communities like uh, LambdaConf and uh, ComposeConf, and you know a lot of online communities where we have you know a lot of like-minded people, a lot of people using uh, maybe different languages than us, but understand that functional programming is great. But like they're that we're tiny. Um, at the same time, functional programming, I think, is the next frontier for mainstream programming languages. A, uh, a less charitable interpretation of this is that Java and C Sharp are appropriating functional programming features and sort of just slapping them on the language and calling it a good day. But like, you know, step into that a little bit. Uh, you know, I work with the people who design and implement C Sharp and they are very uh, deliberate about the things that they're adding to the language today. Uh, C Sharp 9 is going to be adding records, uh, which are sourced, uh, I mean, not directly from F Sharp, but very highly influenced from F Sharp. In fact, some of the syntax is extremely similar. Uh, their records support inheritance, which is an interesting thing that uh, we don't do in F Sharp. And so um, I think it's an interesting take on record extensibility. Uh, but this is a great way to do immutable data in C Sharp and think in terms of expressions and um, you know, do functional programming. Like this is one of the tools that we have is, is record types and immutability and data types that do things like emit default to quality and comparison. So you don't have to really, you know, do all that OOP, implement get hash code, implement dot equals, like crap like that. It, um, this, is, this is coming. Uh, similarly, it's not, it's not just records. Um, C Sharp uh, supports, uh, patterns like a form of pattern matching that they're continually evolving and they're going to continue to evolve when uh, records land and they're eventually planning for union types and that's going to have implications on pattern matching. You can already write expression oriented code today. Um, and you can define inner functions inside of uh, methods. And so like, you know, on the, on the right hand side, for example, I have this, it's a contrived method called square if even. Um, uh, I think I wrote the, the method right. I, I didn't think too hard as I was writing that. But like, what's important there is I have two expressions that are inner functions that are being called by another expression. Um, everything, it, this is a pure function, right? Like this is just operating in terms of inputs and outputs. I have another function in there that's using a pattern. I have uh, stuff on the, on the, on the left-hand side that's doing some interesting, you know, this thing called a relational pattern. It might look kind of funky, but you know, they're, this stuff is coming and it's being sourced from functional programming languages. And if I want to, like, I actually maintain about a 15,000 line of code uh, tool and written in C Sharp to help converting some, help convert some code bases from older.net to newer.net. And I can definitely tell you that if you want to do functional programming, you can, in some extent, you can do it already with some of this modern C Sharp and it's going to become more and more like that. But, well, and I think the other thing I should call out is that it's not just C Sharp that's doing this. Java is getting very similar features, but it's also, it's not all perfect for them. Um, you know, there's a lot of functional programming features that are being added in a very short amount of time here. Uh, and it's going to cause object-oriented programmers to, you know, have some difficult questions they have to ask, right? Like if I've spent 10 years learning OOP patterns, you know, it, am I getting a signal from the designers of the language right now that that stuff is kind of junk and maybe I need to go learn something else? Well, why is that? Uh, am I going to be okay as a longtime Java developer um, going into a new, you know, quote unquote, modern Java code base and not recognizing half of the stuff that I saw? Uh, you know, am I going to have to learn an entirely new way of programming just to continue using the language that I have known for a very long time? And then also, like, it's not as if OOP is done. It's not like they're finished with improvements that they could make in object-oriented programming, right? So like 
is sort of this question, like why focus on that instead of adding functional features or things that come from FP land? Uh, I think these are very difficult things that OOP developers are going to face once um, a lot of these modern things in C Sharp and Java, and I think to some extent C++ start to spread throughout their, uh, their ecosystems. We're seeing a little, bit of that, a little bit of that already on the C Sharp side. Um, this is a small sampling of some negative feedback where they are comparing C Sharp to C++ in a negative light. Uh, sort of saying, hey, you know, I appreciate the stuff that you're doing, but I have a fear that if you graph too many things onto this language that is at its core an imperative object-oriented programming language, then maybe it'll just become too large and incomprehensible or just too hard to understand and maybe I'll have to use something else. Uh, this is a very real challenge that the people on the C-sharp and the Java side are going to have to face. And I think um, they run a risk, like, I mean, if I could summarize it all, like, you know, they're running a risk of getting a little bit chunky. Uh, they're, you know, if you have what is fundamentally a language that is imperative, object-oriented, or designed for systems programming, adopting a whole suite of functional programming features, there, there's a pretty big impedance mismatch there. And you know, naturally there's gonna be some, uh, some take backs from a design standpoint where it's not gonna be like, you know, as, as much functional programming as it could be. Uh, but it's a challenge. And I think that ultimately represents an opportunity for us, um, those of us who, who operate in functional programming landscapes, right? We love the languages that we use that were designed for functional programming from the outset. Right? You know, we're not, we're not, you know, advocating very heavily for, you know, this, like, I mean, nobody's going to look at Haskell, for example, and say it wasn't designed for functional programming. And, you know, maybe there are some people who don't like Scala and say, oh, yeah, yeah whatever, it's OOP plus functional or whatever. But, like, these languages that we use and love are designed for FP, and these other languages that are more mainstream were not really designed for that. Um, and I think we can inject ourselves into conversations about you know, adopting functional programming. And if it's appropriate to be doing it in a language that is rooted in OOP versus a language that is rooted in FP. So I think before I, you know, this is a little bit of doom and gloom, but you know, I want to recall some of the strengths that we have, right? These languages focusing on FP is no mistake. Um, I think most of us understand now that functional programming languages give us better tools to model domains. And we understand that when you're programming, you're likely working with collections of data that you're going to be transforming in some way. And higher order functions are just really, really good for that stuff. And having higher order functions, you know, as, you know, list combinators, as sequence combinators, having a standard library that allows you to do this sort of stuff um, is just essential. It's part and parcel of just functional programming. You model a domain that you have separated from your functionality and you operate on the data that is constructed as a domain model. Now data is likely immutable, and when it's immutable, you make less mistakes. Like this is standard stuff that we all know, that we appreciate, and we sometimes even take for granted in the languages that we use. Um, this is starting to come into these other languages, and you know the fact that we have this built in, you know, from from the outset, is is a really big advantage that we have. I think the library ecosystem in functional programming is also amazing. Uh, I think, you know, when I look at the packages that are on Haskell or, sorry, on Hackage or Cargo or, you know, some of the Scala libraries out there, some of the F-sharp libraries out there, there's a lot of incredible capabilities, especially when you want to do more effective domain modeling, you want to transform your data a little bit more fancy, uh, or you just want to have a beautiful abstraction for, I don't know, like routing in HTTP. Uh, we have amazing libraries for this stuff. We're, I, think we're, I think we honestly think that uh, across pretty much every functional programming language, we're in a great space in terms of libraries for getting stuff done. And I think relative to our size, right? You know, we, we are a niche, but I think we innovate a lot relative to other communities, right? If you want to legitimately not use JavaScript in a web UI, if you're using Scala, F Sharp, or OCaml, you have an industrial strength compiler that's supported by people. You even have uh, libraries and frameworks for building that stuff that can even you know, incorporate like React and, and other, uh, other NPM libraries. Similarly, if you wanna use Elm or PureScript, like the, you can just do it. Like you don't have to use JavaScript and this is, this is the functional programmers offering really great ways to build UIs for the web. 
Uh, I think WebAssembly is also an interesting place. It's, uh, I think it's kind of a wait and see sort of situation, but already uh, Rust and F-sharp have fully supported ways to build UIs with WebAssembly that already have UI libraries. And I know that Scala and Haskell have um, uh, ways that you can use uh, WASM as well. I don't know if there's any supported ways at this time, but um, like already this is sort of potentially the future of web applications. And we're already seeing some of the languages, some of the FP languages working in the space and not only working, but being in a supported, working in a supported manner with UI libraries, which is what people come to expect. So I think we're in a pretty good space as far as our ecosystems are concerned. If we have great libraries and, you know, as much as I uh, can appreciate, um, you know, the, the next library that, that, you know, merges together something beautiful from category theory into, you know, a new, uh, a new way that you do something with web apps. Um, I, I think we're actually in a pretty good space as far as that. Like, I, you know, there's, there's always room for more libraries, but I also think at the same time, uh, there's a lot of energy that we could direct in other places that would help um, FP language adoption a little bit more. And that's what I want to get into next. First, I need a quick drink of water. So getting into things to try next, I'm going to try to be as specific as I can um, because I want these to ultimately be things that people try, not necessarily, like, I, I don't want these to, you know, come off as like me just sort of preaching a bunch of opinions. I want to sort of have it be interpreted as things that I think we could actually go and either do or advocate for um, and try to measure the results of. Right? Focusing on Windows and SQL, um, focusing and advocating for better tooling uh, and like amazing tooling. And I'll talk about you know what some potential next gen tooling could look like there. Um, some, you know, like there's this simple Haskell movement that I want to talk a little bit about and how uh, that could be you know an avenue for growth and focusing on hiring junior developers. So when I say Windows and SQL, um, this is me trying to be specific, right? Ultimately, we need to be meeting software developers where they are today rather than forcing them to come over into a different environment or use a different you know, database, for example, um, than what they have to use today. And uh, when I, I looked at some trends from some you know, industry leader surveys, I think a lot of it really does boil down to Windows and SQL. Right. So in the Stack Overflow 2020 survey uh, for this year, they found that most developers write their code on Windows. Um, or at least most developers who answered the survey, which is a pretty big sample. So I think it's, it's good data. Um, yeah, there's a lot of people using Mac OS and using Linux. And I think those are actually perhaps even growing year over year. But Windows is the lion's share right now. Similarly, when you look at deploying code, you might expect that, you know, okay, well, there's a lot of people writing code on Windows, but surely they're deploying their code to Linux. Well, yeah, but they're also deploying a lot to Windows. 51.2% uh, is, that, that's a lot. That's actually a lot more than I would have expected. There was a JetBrains survey um, that they put out, and they found that 60% of respondents developed their code on Windows. It's pretty big. It's uh, their primary customer base is um, uh, Java developers. So, you know. um, if I look at uh, SQL, it's it's actually pretty wild. Aside from JavaScript and HTML and CSS, SQL is the language that most respondents say they regularly write code in. And so, yeah, this also includes you know database admins who you know may not necessarily be touching application code. But if you're a software developer, there's a pretty good chance you're writing some SQL, or at least you're interfacing with some SQL. And there, it's, it's so much SQL, honestly. Like, like, you know, in the Stack Overflow uh, uh, survey, you know, Mongo is the only thing that sort of comes close. And even then, there's four different databases that people are using more than Mongo. Uh, it's actually a similar picture on the JetBrains survey, um, except in this case, Mongo is a little higher for the people they surveyed. But I mean, still, like nearly 60% of respondents say they use MySQL. That is, that's a lot of people. That really is a lot of people. And so I, I think this, this opens us up to some interesting questions um, to different audiences, right? The first, I think, is library authors, which is first, like, if you own a library or you maintain a library, like, do you use Windows? Have you built and tested your library there recently? Um, do you have components in your library that either explicitly or implicitly assume that somebody's running on Unix? And if so, why? Uh, is, is there a way to get that to work on Windows? Um, if so, that's a pretty decent chunk of people who could then start using your library. 
Uh, similarly, uh, do you have a library that's about working with SQL or, you know, actually is it adjacent, right? Maybe your library has nothing to do with SQL, but maybe it just sort of happens to be used by a lot of people who are using a different component that interfaces with SQL. Uh, maybe that's an interesting place to explore and see if your library has any problems when it's used in that context. Uh, is there room for more libraries actually? You know, I actually just got done saying that I think we're pretty great as far as libraries are concerned, but maybe there actually is room for more libraries specifically when it comes to SQL. If you're a tooling author, which I technically am, so these are sort of somewhat selfish questions, but um, there may be some folks in the audience or people who watch you know, this, this on YouTube who, who fall under this category. Does your tool run on Windows? And if, if yes, cool, but like, is it also first class or do Windows developers have some additional annoying things they have to deal with just to use your tool? Uh, why or why not? Is there something you can do about that? You know, uh, Windows developers, or rather I should say a lot of people who use stuff on Windows come to expect things to be a bit more integrated, like the integrated development environment. And so does your tool sort of have, does it get used in conjunction with an editing tool? Um, if yes, like does it work differently in that context on Windows versus other ones? This is kind of a more specific uh, version of that first set of questions, but I, I think it's, a, it's good to call it out specifically for Windows because that is where a lot of the developers tend to expect IDEs rather than you know, a whole bunch of disjoint tools that they then assemble into their own tooling stack. And also if you have a tool that involves SQL, what can you improve, right? Um, do you think it's good enough? Are, are there people who have, you know, filed some bugs that you think worth fixing? Like, you know, if you're interested in helping a library author or a tool author, you know, improve stuff, um, maybe search for ones that involve SQL or are SQL adjacent, uh, because you could be impacting a lot of people. I think uh, for everyone as a whole, like, I mean, so the reason why I bring this up is I was at LambdaConf last year and almost every single speaker whose talk I attended was using Nix. And like, I'm sure they have good reasons for it, but like, I hope that those who are giving the talks and, and, and using Nix are well aware that the vast majority of software developers do not use their operating system and do not interact with their system in the same way. Uh, and so I think it's just sort of worth asking, like, have you used Windows recently? And you know, do things work okay there? Like. Can you do what you would normally do there? If, if not, why? Like, what are, what are the problems and what are some things that you might be able to, you know, I don't know, maybe file, file bugs on or, you know, go to the feedback thing on Windows and say, hey, it'd be really great if you do this. Uh, same thing goes for SQL. Like, you know, I, I think there's probably a lot of folks watching this who use SQL every day, um, but there may be some folks who are, you know, doing a bit more advanced, maybe fancy stuff and doing a lot of NoSQL. Um, have you tried using SQL recently? And then lastly, like, I think th this perhaps applies more to Windows than it does to SQL, but um, can you help someone who is trying to use a thing that you're involved with or that you know a lot about, but they're using it in an environment that you're not normally using, right? Are you normally a Linux or a Mac OS user? And is somebody using your favorite library on Windows and having problems with it? Are they trying to install your tool set that, that you love and use? Um, but they don't know how to install it correctly on Windows? Like, are you in a position to be able to help them out? Or are you just in a position to say, yeah, you know what, you should use this other thing instead. Uh, because I think if you're in that latter position, you're not gonna be very helpful to these people. And, uh, you know, helping people out on basic things like being able to install things, being able to just use things and get to the point where they can start learning how to use something correctly uh, is gonna be the difference between a lot of adoption versus people just sort of giving up and moving on to something else. And so I think really sort of when we talk about meeting, or sorry, when I talk about meeting developers where they are, addressable markets, I think specifically people who are on Windows and people who are working with SQL databases is a big thing to focus on. Uh, yeah, it represents the majority, but I also think there's a lot of energy, uh, especially in some functional programming communities that sort of leaves Windows and SQL out or, you know, it just doesn't really, you know, focus on it very much. Maybe that's something that's worth focusing on a little bit. So the next one, uh, better tooling, is something that I'm just going to call out is extremely challenging and expensive. And I know this firsthand because I've been trying to build better tooling for a programming language for the past four years of my life. Uh, so 
if there's anybody watching and you know just sort of has like this this uh, this reaction of like yeah of course tooling should be better don't you know how hard it is like trust me I, I appreciate how incredibly difficult better tooling is but I want to talk about it because I think it's really important um, I know how to program in C I, sorry I know how to program in C sharp uh, I've been writing C sharp code since about 2013 uh, a little bit less these days compared to when I first started. But when I use C Sharp, I get 2,200 on the fly code inspections. I get 60 plus refactorings and 450 plus code actions in my editor. That is an absurd amount of tooling. That is like, I can write pretty much any kind of C Sharp code that I want, and I will get something showing up in my editor letting me know that maybe I could do it better, which is pretty radical. And if we look into like what the reason for that is, well, if we look at the, um, Jeff Rains posted this wonderful blog post with their .NET department, they have 90 people working on their tooling. That's 90 world-class engineers building really good tooling for people using C Sharp and you know, a little bit of C++, but it is primarily C Sharp. Um, they actually also have now some F Sharp tooling that they're building who uh, we collaborate with, which is a fun fact, but like, wow, 90 people. That is a lot of tooling. And it's not just, you know, the, the, the quick fixes and the refactorings and the people working in JetBrains. Um, um, Microsoft, we also have a lot of people working on C Sharp tooling and we're exploring how to incorporate, you know, very sensibly uh, machine learning. Uh, we call it AI for marketing, but, you know, machine learning to be, to be able to say like, you know, yes, okay, if you're typing something in a completion list, we know statically what's going to be available to you. So we can help you explore an API, you know, through a completion list. But we may also recognize that, you know, some of these things that we know statically are a lot better in the context of the code that you're operating in than other things. And maybe we could emphasize, you know, perhaps suggest certain things that we think are going to make more sense. Uh, Python and JavaScript are also getting this feature. It's called IntelliCode. Uh, so this is where tooling is, is evolving today and it's going to be evolving over the next 10 years. This is important to know. Because I think if we want to explore what better tooling means for functional programming languages, we have a lot to cover. I think, uh, you know, firstly, when we talk about editor tooling, diagnostics and lack thereof are what really matter. Um, I, I'm not like the best Scala developer in the world, so maybe it's just me holding it wrong, but you know, the last time I tried to use IntelliJ Scala, I had to actually build it to see if the thing would really work, uh, which is totally unacceptable. Um, you know, I understand that it's incredibly hard work to do because I also work on you know, a diagnostics engine for a, a programming language and it's really hard. But like, this is the mode that people use mainstream languages. This is their thinking. If they have to build something to see if it's going to actually work rather than just get the feedback directly in their editor, that, that's almost like a deal breaker. Similarly, auto-completion and tooltips um, are something that have to work because this is how people explore APIs in their editor without having to read documentation. Um, and, you know, we need to make sure that we have just good tooling for doing this sort of stuff. Uh, if we want, like, if we want to say that we have good tooling, this is what it actually means. Uh, and there's also a second level of this. It's not just about exploration, but, you know, do, do the tools that we have guide the developers, right? You know, if you're using Scala and you are in, you're using metals inside of VS Code, um, is, is metals helping you write good code? Or is it just helping you write code that does something? Uh, that's that's sort of an interesting distinction that, that's being explored more and more that I'll talk a little bit about uh, in the future. And, and then and then lastly, an important thing that I think worth calling out is that all code is wrong until it's right, which is to say that uh, when you're typing code, your code is incomplete. It's not in a correct state. And so there's this question of does your editor know what to do with that or does it just sort of give up or even worse, just sort of freak out and say, oh, I don't know what you're doing. Uh, this is what better tooling means. These are the sorts of things that we'll have to advocate for and perhaps even build ourselves. Debugging is also a big deal. Um, I've heard from many people, including those in functional programming communities, that if you don't need a debugger, uh, debugging is just a sign of weak programming skills, blah, blah, blah. And like to that, I say, cool, I wish I was as smart as you because um, I need a debugger all the time. And it really frustrates me when I try to use a debugger and I can't introspect the code to like see what it's doing at runtime so I can figure out what's wrong with it and then move on with my life. 
right? And there's, there's a couple different levels to this, right? Like, first of all, how much configuration do you need to actually debug something in your language? Right? If, the, if the answer is anything less than hit a single, a single key to run and debug your app when you have some breakpoints set inside of your editor, then that's going to be a problem for people who are used to C Sharp and, uh, and Java and C++. Uh, there's also this question of debugability, right? Um, Point-free programming, I know for a fact, is very difficult to debug because there's there's like no values, right? You're just sort of composing these things together, or rather, there's values, but like it's um, from the debugger standpoint, you just have these expressions that are composed together. So, to my knowledge, there isn't very any uh, debugging tooling around, um, you know, point-free pipelines, for example. Um, Type level programming is something that it's big and subsets of the Haskell and uh, Scala communities. Uh, what does it mean to debug type level programs? And like, is the, the stuff that you're doing with your types, like are you doing it correctly? And if you're not doing it correctly, how can you find out what's going wrong? Like, you know, and, and, and I think the notion of debuggability is a little bit different there because that, that may not necessarily, um, be the sort of same like you know step by step this is the value this is the next step and it's this value instead like thing that c sharp and java developers are used to uh, so there may actually be some interesting r d work to sort of explore what can be done there um, another interesting thing is debugging containers we're increasingly seeing that people are building their code in a container and they want to run it in another container and sometimes debuggers fall apart when that happens that makes developers very mad so uh, we got to make sure that is also in a good place Another aspect of tooling is REPLs and interactivity, which I think we're actually in a pretty good spot, at least in terms of foundational stuff. Certainly, people in the Closure community have a, uh, a great uh, REPL, but there's sort of questions of, you know, how integrated is this REPL with editor tools, right? Can I just type some code and, you know, send it to the REPL and get a value? More importantly, can my REPL understand the code and the context that I'm operating in so that I don't have to, you know, do a bunch of setup to sort of get it into a state where I can, uh, you know, maybe query some parts of my code base and see what the values come out as. Uh, there's also a question of Jupyter and VS Code notebooks. Um, this is the preferred tool set of data scientists who are a very large cohort of software developers. Now, they're, they're not really traditional software developers. Like a lot of them are, code is sort of just a means to an end to, you know, for them to do what is ultimately just math stuff. Uh, but they have a particular way of doing things. And this sort of this question of, okay, well, functional programming function is in the name. Surely we're pretty good at some of this stuff that you want to do. Um, I, you know, I, I know that uh, some of the machine learning research going into right now is all about like trying to calculate derivatives better. Like that's a form of higher order functions, you could say. Um, you know, maybe we have an appropriate language for the tasks that people are trying to do, but you know, do we work in the environments that they expect them to work in? Can we produce data from Scala or Haskell in a uh, Jupyter notebook and have it produce a nice table output or produce an inline graph? Or can we uh, import uh, one of these notebooks into a VS Code notebook? Um, can we even use it in VS Code in the first place? Can we, in these uh, notebooks, can we specify that uh, you know, we want to include an additional package at this point in time and not force somebody to have to shut down their Jupyter server and restart it to be able to uh, actually reference that package? Like, there's a whole lot in, in, in that space, and I think that's something that we could explore. Another big one is analysis and profiling tools. Right? This is especially important in like enterprise environments. Um, like, how do you tell if your code is right? Like, I don't, and by right, I don't mean compiles. I mean, like, it's doing things the right way. Because there's all sorts of ways that you can do stuff that compiles, but it's not probably going to be ideal. So, like, can it, are there tools that can tell you if certain things are ideal or not? And do they work in an editing environment? Right. Another thing is when you have your uh, application running, can you do memory and CPU profiling? And can you present the results of that profiling work in a comprehensible manner to people? Uh, that's actually a difficult question. Um, JetBrains, uh, that brought, bring them up again, they have some pretty good tooling for this sort of stuff. And what's important is not like, you know, that they have the most advanced profilers in existence. Uh, it's that when you use the profiler, it spits out a report that you can read and understand really easily, right? You don't wanna be in a position where like, yes, oh, don't worry, boss, we can do all this memory and CPU profiling for our Scala application, but, 
we need someone who's a real expert in this tool to be able to even understand the results. That's probably not a good enough space. Um, and then lastly, like there are a lot of decision makers in larger companies who are not involved in the technology, right? They, they probably don't even care what language you're using just so long as you're providing value to the business. But some of that value comes in the form of compliance checklists. And, you know, regardless of if some of these tools are important or meaning or even like useful in any way, uh, they need to check a box on a checklist. And if they can't check that box, then the language is just not going to be adopted in that context. Or if it is adopted, it has now a pretty big uphill battle. So it's something to keep in mind. I think it kind of sucks personally because I don't think these sorts of checklists should exist, but they do. And so, you know, we need to have an answer for uh, these sorts of things. The last uh, tooling thing is about next gen tooling, right? And this is, you know, more of a, a more of like a, a future, you know, kind of kind of more looking into the future rather than right now because, you know, this code in the cloud stuff that uh, you know Microsoft is doing today with uh, in collaboration with GitHub. GitHub is owned by Microsoft, so I guess it's all the same. Um, uh, with code spaces and some live collaboration tools and some AI assisted tooling to show completion that understands your domain a little bit better, make some recommendations. Um, none of this stuff is like released yet or like it's kind of a preview, but I think this is something that we, we got to keep our eye on and we got, you know, maybe, maybe there's an opportunity to say like, you know, okay, well, having incredible tooling um, for debugging may not be feasible to pull off, but maybe as a community we could uh, center around, you know, making Scala, Haskell, F Sharp, OCaml available in uh, some of these features uh, related to AI assisted programming. And maybe through the, uh, the magic slash mathematics of uh, deep learning, they could, um, you know, understand code base structures in our languages just as easily as they do other languages. And so we don't necessarily need to have a mountain of uh, tooling to support this sort of stuff. This is an important thing that I think we could go and look into and inquire about and advocate for people to build if we're not willing to build them ourselves. So I think sort of the central point here is that there's a lot to it, but I think that ultimately we can build and advocate for good tooling for functional programming languages. And I think this is really important because, you know, there's some of us who are really, really smart and we can deal with not very good uh, tooling. But I will also say that people who are okay with dealing with not a whole lot of tooling are probably in the upper echelon as far as programmers are concerned. And, you know, or like, you know, we're just really, really good at like languagey sort of stuff. But, you know, maybe there's people who are amazing experts in other domains, just other things, and they don't really care as much about some of the stuff that we care about. Um, and they want good tooling because they don't want to have to be constantly jumping through hoops and thinking about interesting ways to get around this little weird thing that it says in the editor and like things like that. Um, so, yeah, I think we could uh, we could explore the space a lot. And uh, I, I have some some more specific ideas that I could go through in a Q and A section for this. Another um, interesting topic is uh, simple language emphasis. Oh, my slide is actually wrong. I meant to say simple Scala instead of Scala for data scientists. Um, so there's sort of this underlying question that I and I think other people have, which is do we have too many options? Right? If we consider everything that you can do in Haskell, everything you can do in Scala, everything you can do in F Sharp, all of the, you know, a lot of features in Rust, for example, there's a lot of features, there's a lot of stuff. Right? There, there is a lot that our languages can do, and it can be overwhelming. Now, I think of this list, I think F Sharp and Rust in particular have managed to sort of position, at least the communities have managed to position themselves as sort of kind of hiding some of the complexity. Uh, I don't know if they've done it as best as they possibly can, but you know, I think it's been a bit more successful than the Scala and Haskell side. Um, but we have a lot of options, and that's a great thing if you know what you're doing, but if you don't know what you're doing, it can be kind of daunting. Also, we can't just delete features, right? You know, we may agree that some stuff is a little over the top, right? Oh, we just, you know, Scala macros are just so problematic, blah, blah, blah. But like, you know, at the same time, a lot of good things are built with features that you may not necessarily like. And compatibility is a very important feature for a programming language. And so if, you, if we just 
You know, if we were to advocate for just wholesale deleting all sorts of different stuff, I don't think that would fly. And I don't think that would be a way to achieve simplicity for you know, whatever definition I'm sort of implying here. Uh, similarly, uh, enterprises can care about Enterprise big companies care about compatibility and longevity. And anytime their development team says, oh, well, we, we have to you know, spend some time uh, migrating because of reasons, that's just, that just means that we're losing money because instead of adding value, you're doing technology churn. And the more of that you have to do, the less likely you're going to be able to find adoption in an enterprise. So I think there's an interesting way to look at this that seems like it's perhaps started by some Haskellers, uh, where it's about emphasizing sort of a small subset of the Haskell language, or maybe not small, but you know, a subset of it that is relatively easy to understand and you can sort of keep in your head at one time. Um, I think this is a very interesting thing to explore. I think we should support people who want to do something with this simple Haskell initiative. Not because, you know, I have this, you know, very strong, like practically religious belief that, it, that Haskell must be simple or something like that. But I think there's a lot to learn from here. I think if we can support some of the people who have written blog posts talking about what they would like to do, um, maybe we could see more adoption or maybe we don't. And if we don't, maybe we could understand why we didn't see adoption or like, you know, maybe it doesn't work out in Haskell, but if you were to try the same thing in Scala with, uh, I don't know, maybe when Scala 3 releases, uh, maybe a similar thing could happen. Or, you know, maybe what didn't work in Haskell works in Scala, or maybe it works in F-sharp, but it didn't work in Rust. Like, um, there's a lot that we could learn from here. And I'd be very interested in seeing what that could do and how I could support people uh, in, in this way. And so I think there's some concrete things to consider when it means, you know, simple whatever, right? And I think a lot of it actually just boils down to this first question, which is how many times is it okay to repeat yourself? Uh, I know that there, there's a very strong fascination with a lot of people in FP communities about, you know, at, at all costs, we must ensure that we don't repeat ourselves. But I don't know, maybe it's okay to repeat ourselves every once in a while. Maybe like after four or five times is too much, but if we have to repeat ourselves three times, is that really a problem? I don't know. I think another uh, angle to look at this is, say you have someone from college who just doesn't have much experience in your language and they get tossed into your code base and they need to add value within three months. How long is it gonna take for them to ramp up, right? Uh, can you look at code in your code base and then look at code online somewhere else and see similarities? Can you pull a book off of Amazon and can you read some of what it has to say, learn things and apply those teachings to your own code base? Or are things too different? Right? I think these are, these are things to consider here because if, if you are too complicated and incorporating way too many things, it may be difficult to do these, to, uh, you know, incorporate from online, incorporate things from books, you know, have new people come into the code base and be productive. Uh, and then there's also a tooling angle with this, which is, you know, do we have tools that actually incentivize certain patterns versus other patterns? Uh, that could be tied to any initiatives, you know, aligned with this. And, and so this is more of a question, like I, I don't really, like I believe that we should emphasize these sorts of things. I think it's worth trying. I don't know if it's inherently good or bad, but I think it's something that's worth exploring and learning from because I don't think it's been done in a lot of functional programming communities. And then sort of the last one that I want to cover, hopefully I don't run out of time here, hopefully I don't too talk too fast either, is hiring junior developers. Right? This is more targeted at people who are in a position to hire people, right? You're in a position to power, what are you going to do with that power? Um, so this is actually something that's a little close to home, right? So my wife has a uh, master's in geology. Been, she had a relatively short uh, career in geology before she decided it just wasn't for her. So she went to a coding boot camp. Um, she, along with um, what is apparently about 40,000 people last year, um, I could believe that number, uh, went to a coding boot camp and graduated because they wanted a job doing the stuff that we do. And here's an interesting statistic that I just made up, but it's probably true. Uh, the percentage of people who want jobs after they have graduated from a coding boot camp is probably near 100%. Right? And I think this is important because I'm not convinced that in the functional programming land, land you know, especially from a hiring perspective, we're focused on hiring people like this. 
I, I didn't even talk about college grads, which I know there's certainly more than four, uh, you know, 35,000, sorry, 34,000 of. You know, I think we're mostly going after senior developers, right? People who have experience with Java and C Sharp and get disillusioned with OOP, they, they catch the Kool-Aid, you know, they, they drink the functional programming Kool-Aid and a lot of functional programming advocacy is oriented for, towards these people, right? You know, we already, there's a lot of talks, especially like talks that I, that I went to last year at uh, LambdaConf and uh, ComposeConf. There was a lot of focus talking about on how we build things, but there was very little about what we're actually building, right? You know, stories from building web applications, right? How did, how did, your, how did your system scale to a million lines of code, right? Um, what did you do to manage that complexity? Like we don't, there doesn't seem to be that many topics associated with that. Additionally, uh, I think functional programming attracts a lot of world experts and you know, there's like this meme that like, you know, oh, Haskell developers all have PhDs or whatever, but like, yeah, there actually are quite a few PhDs in the Haskell world and by definition, they are world experts. And so as a result of that, when you have a lot of world experts in a topic, you're gonna be getting a lot of expert material uh, and you're gonna be like looking for people who are experts. Um, I think this is something that if you're in a position of hiring people, you might be able to change, right? I think it's also challenging to hire functional programming developers, right? Uh, I bring up jet.com. I've, I've worked with multiple engineering teams there over, you know, addressing some issues that they were able to identify in the f -sharp language and tools. Um, you know, it's sort of a weird story where, you know, the jet.com brand is now sort of, it's been discontinued. It's all just Walmart. But the way that I look at it is this is an engineering group was able to build a $3.3 billion business on functional programming. I, I don't know if there's a more successful story for functional programming than making a $3.3 billion business. And so we could argue about whether or not Walmart really needed to pay that much money. But the fact that they're willing to pay that much money means that's how successful they were. Uh, and, uh, you know, speaking with some of the people inside Jet, you know, they, they exhausted their developer base in New York City pretty quickly of people who were experts and they had to start a training program. And I think a lot of senior functional programming developers, which they sort of found out, are very opinionated. And I think there's a lot of people who are like, oh, well, if I don't have, you know, higher kind of types, GADTs, higher rank types, this and that, I'm not even going to get out of bed. Um, that can be a problem if you're trying to hire. Uh, Junior developers are perhaps not as much of a problem in that aspect, right? They're cheaper and they're more flexible, they're eager to learn, and they don't have as much to unlearn. And at the end of the day, they really do want a job, right? Out of the 40,000 people who graduated from a code school last year, I don't think they really are gonna care if it's Haskell or Scala, if it's, like if it's Scala versus JavaScript, like they're not gonna care um, so much as are they going to get a job and is that job going to pay them and is it going to be a decent environment where they can learn things from people and feel like they're supported and build pretty decent things right and so it's hard because these people are going to need more guidance and you know they, they may not really appreciate some of the awesome abstractions that we're able to concoct because they haven't you know developed that uh understanding over you know a, a, an entire career um but i think i think it's worth it and if we want to find them, like they exist and it's not just, you know, it's going to take more work though. It's not like you can just put up a job opening and say, okay, here you go. Everybody apply for this, right? You got to reach out to code schools because they have internship programs, but you, you have to reach out to them. Otherwise they're not going to know who you are. Um, a lot of universities and even community colleges have dedicated corporate relations officers who you can find on LinkedIn and you can just message them and say, hey, I'm interested in the software development clubs that you have at your school. Right? I'm interested in maybe hosting a hackathon where I'll give away an Xbox for someone and maybe the winner will have like an, a chance at an internship because, you know, it turns out they were really, really smart and they were able to learn stuff really quickly. Um, speaking of PhDs, how many of you still keep in touch with professors or, you know, other instructors, you know, are you willing to do guest lectures, you know, expose some of the other things that you've been able to find outside of academia to some of the people who are still learning things. Um, I think it's hard, but I think it's possible. And I honestly think that, you know, if people who are in a position to hire in uh, functional programming communities really dedicated time to juniors, I think we could add 30,000 new functional programmers to our communities every single year. And probably more than 30,000, um, you know, if, if we look at, you know, how many people there are in total that could be added, but um, I think that's a pretty reasonable number. And that's sort of a question, like, could we? 
I'd like to think so. I'd certainly like to see somebody try and report back on what it was like. So, well, unfortunately, I did go over, but um, this is now the Q&A section because uh, my point here wasn't to really sort of throw out a whole bunch of opinions about things. Uh, maybe some of this did come off a little opinion and a little preachy. Um, but I just want to, I'm really focused mostly on identifying specific things that I think we might be able to try or at least start conversations on. And um, I would like to just hear what people have to say about this. And you know, maybe there's some amazing things that I have not considered that would be worth bringing up and having conversations amongst ourselves about. So that's what I got. And uh, I'm here for questions. Okay, well, so we have a couple of, um, we have a couple of things so far. So one was more of a comment, but maybe you could comment on the comment. It says, um, tooling should be composable. <laughs> So, so, sorry, what was that? Tooling should be composable. Tooling should be composable. Um, yes. Uh, I have certainly run into places where tooling is not composable. Um, that can be a problem. I will say that I, that is a principle that I believe in. I had, don't know if I've seen enough evidence to suggest that it is what ultimately matters. Um, I think like as a principle, if I were to be doing, if I were to like start from scratch doing, building some new programming language tooling, what I would first start with is making sure that there's a really good command line experience that you know, has everything very discoverable. And then any UI that I were to build on top of that tooling would ultimately like call into command line stuff. So there's just sort of this one-to-one -one representation between what's going on in a visual experience versus what's going on from the command line. Um, that tool should also understand that there are other tools perhaps operating in that same space. And if that's what's sort of meant by composability, then yeah, that's definitely essential. Um, so yeah, that's probably a good point. I think that's something that I should have uh, should have probably brought up. Okay, so the next question is, so the need for things like simple Haskell is interesting, and I wonder if this is the reason that Golang, a language that's considered simplistic and lacking modern features, gained so much traction. Did they, is it because they made it simple, even if at the cost um, of some repetition? I, Golang is fun. I, I think sometimes I, I so, I know some people who have interacted directly with Rob Pike, and he is a bit of an interesting person. Uh, they have used some words to describe him that you know I probably won't necessarily repeat here. Uh, and I think that's important to contextualize because I think the definition of simple and easy uh, from the Golang perspective is very much influenced by its creator, who is an extremely opinionated man. Uh, I think there is an element to that working though, because you can, you can write Golang code and just look at, you could just Google for it and you're probably gonna find code that looks very similar to the stuff that you're writing. And that I think is an extremely important thing to sort of try to emulate. I think Golang maybe goes a little bit too far um, so, so much as they, they, might, they might be even, you know, like there, there's some philosophical choices they have that I think might be, even insulting to those who uh, you know enjoy things like generics um, or you know other features that do provide value to people and there's there's uh, there has been some preaching in the past around go that has explicitly said that those things are not very valuable uh, which I think is wrong um, but I think their emphasis matters and I think it's helped I think also what helps though is I think a whole lot of Ruby developers were fed up with bad performance and I think a lot of them found that they could throw some Go code together and it would perform pretty well. Uh, and I think that that does tie into the simplicity aspect of it a bit, right? That what I just said, throw some code together. Like they probably didn't have to decide which of the multitude of features they were going to incorporate. They probably just had sort of a standard way of doing stuff that basically worked and it worked fine. And sort of that, that end goal is the thing that we want to sort of strive for in, in, in our languages. And so, um, that's what I would what I would say is like you know at at a high level if you're using Haskell can you just throw some code together and make 
it work? Uh, can you look online at, you know, some of the top questions on Stack Overflow, maybe some of the stop, maybe some of the top stuff that you find on Google search results and have it look like the code that you're writing? Uh, if not, then that's where I think there's sort of work to be done. Um, but yeah. Next question, sorry. Apart from the tooling you mentioned, are there other attempts to bring FP into the data science and bioinformatics world? So great support for statistics and plotting like in R. Um, machine learning made as accessible as in Python. Yes, uh, actually there, there are. I think that the machine learning thing is something I didn't really touch on that much here. Uh, I think so. I sort of made this point about, you know, yeah, I think we're pretty good on the libraries front. We should probably focus on some other stuff. I don't think that's actually true for uh, machine learning. I think in part due to the fact that uh, machine learning is still, it's a very uh, immature place right now. You know, yeah, there's like TensorFlow and PyTorch are sort of eating the world and Python is the default language that you use for this stuff. But when you go and talk to people who are actually using Python and these frameworks, they're not always having a good time. And there's a lot of stuff that's super complicated and has super rough edges. Uh, some of it's library related. And so this is actually something we're exploring on the F Sharp side. Um, there's a wonderful library for uh, automatic differentiation called Diff Sharp that we're revamping and um, we're sort of, it has a way that you can do stuff on the CPU today, but we're uh, revamping it with some uh, new language features that are being added to the language too. Um, uh, allow for translation of uh, F-sharp into a format that's going to run on the GPU and then specifically run on the Torch runtime uh, on the GPU and perhaps other uh, hardware. And so there's a lot of challenging things to cover there from a library design standpoint. Um, and I think a lot of it is where functional programming can come in, which might actually be another uh, topic for a talk altogether. Um, because like, I mean, I, I can just use the words automatic differentiation. Well, differentiation, that's like, it's literally just you're messing around with functions. Uh, that's, in fact, uh, there is a research project at Google called Google Jax, which is about building, building out uh, a runtime on sort of a subset of the Python language that is focused on functional programming because they identified that the things that they want to do are very much aligned with a lot of functional programming characteristics. Um, so that's something that um, would be a very, very interesting space to explore. And there's definitely more than just tooling to, uh, uh, to consider. All right. So uh, we don't currently have any more questions. So if anybody has anything else to ask, please let us know. Um, but in, while we're waiting for that possibility, Philip, I know that you're not, you're not here to just kind of um, like preach your opinions per se, but mm. I know that you mentioned earlier that you had a couple of things that you might be interested in hitting on. Um, are there questions that haven't been asked that you think are relevant that were not included in your talk? Um, so uh, let's see. Um, one of the one of the things that I've been following along more from the sidelines because I'm not you know primarily a Scala developer is. Uh, the uh, Zio library and sort of ecosystem of other um, libraries. Uh, and uh, I think it, that's something, that's sort of like a space that I've been watching because I've been sort of observing on the sidelines this, uh, you know, Scala in particular sort of moving around as far as where emphasis is being placed. And right now it seems like there's a, a core group of people that are placing emphasis on sort of a simplified Scala, or at least Scala, like sort of very aspects of Scala, very highly emphasized over other aspects and sort of saying things like, you know, effect systems and uh, type classes are just not as important for this kind of programming that you're trying to do. And I think it's been going well, I, at least from what I can see, that could just be, you know, the uh, bias in terms of who I'm following on Twitter and looking at on GitHub and things like that. Um, but that's, that's an, another example of something that I think is worth going in. And like, I think it's, I think we need to do it. Like I, I sort of, I sort of posed it as a question of like, should we do the simple Haskell? Should we do the simple Scala? Uh, my, if I were to provide, if you were to ask me what the answer to that question is, I would say absolutely yes. Um, without a doubt, I think Haskell and Scala are extremely complicated language. Well, sorry, languages. 
um, when I was first learning Haskell in college, like it was already kind of hard. And then uh, I started looking at some stuff online and it was just absolutely incomprehensible to me. Uh, I, I tried using uh, Cabal once back then and I did not have a good time. Uh, I tried to build a web app in Scala once. Um, I didn't have a good time. I mean, this was a few years ago. This wasn't recently like, you know, maybe I'm now just a better programmer or something, but like, I frankly, I've not had very good experiences trying to use Haskell for doing things, uh, even though I had tried in the past. And um, I think uh, that's, that's kind of a problem. Uh, similarly on the Scala side, uh, I've used some Scala in the past. Um, I didn't really like it as, as much. Uh, and I think a lot of that was, you know, I kept seeing stuff online saying that I, I needed to use Scala Z for everything. And like, I just, I looked at the code for Scala Z and I was just like, you gotta be kidding me. And they had, there was like no docs, there was like no guidance. Uh, and I was like, oh, okay, that I, you know, maybe if, if I were to go back in time and look at it, perhaps just, you know, a bit more patiently, uh, I think I might have had a different impression. Um, but really, if you were to ask me, like, you know, should we do these, these simple initiatives? I think it's essential if we want to, um, you know, have any chance at being more than a niche in the next 10 years. Uh, I think on the, the tooling side as well, if you were to ask me, like, what we should focus on the most, I think at the end of the day, accurate diagnostics are the most important. Uh, and then the second most important is attaching ourselves to some of the new stuff that's, that's coming out with AI assisted programming tools, because, um, some of these deep learning things that they're using, they don't actually have any intrinsic understanding of your code or how Scala works or what the type system is. They, they actually like these, these systems don't know what any of that means. And that's actually an advantage because that means that we don't have to build out an understanding of that stuff. Right? Like, I, I know what the F sharp tooling code base is like in terms of building out like a deep understanding of what the, the F sharp type system looks like and how we forward that onto people in terms of editor tooling. It's super complicated and it's really, really hard. And I think if we could avoid doing that hard stuff and you know, basically just saying through the magic of deep learning, your editor knows what you're doing. Uh, I honestly think we could go there, but you know, we'd have to prove it out and we'd have to, um, make feature requests and bombard those feature request systems at GitHub and Microsoft and say, please take this language seriously and engage with those people. You know, there's, there's increasingly a lot of people doing this sort of work on GitHub uh, from Microsoft and from JetBrains and um, uh, I don't know who else is playing in this space. I think Amazon is with the Cloud9 IDE, but they're, they're not really as open source friendly, I think. I don't know, maybe I could be wrong. Um, but like actively engaging with them. Uh, making a lot of noise, uh, I think is, is going to matter here because I think it's going to trans like this stuff is going to transform what uh, programming language tooling is going to be like what, what programming language tooling means in the next 10 years. And I think it's essential that we're sort of at the forefront of that rather than, you know, looking at another thing sort of passing us by and saying, Oh yeah, wouldn't it be great if we had that too. Uh, and then also I would say like from a cultural standpoint, um, there are some people in functional language communities who don't feel like tooling is important. And we need to, uh, like, I, I don't know how the best way to approach this is, but like, I think they're wrong. And, you know, we should encourage them to reconsider those positions. And maybe, you know, like, you know, if somebody goes onto the Haskell subreddit and asks a question about like, hey, why is this so hard? Like, why is it so hard for me to get started? If the first and, up, and most upvoted response, at least at a particular time, is like, yeah, you're just doing it wrong. Don't worry about it. Like, you don't have to do, like, it's not that hard. You just got to think a little bit more. Like, that's not. Nah. Um, that, that's sort of at least my positions on that. So let me ask a let me ask a question for myself. So looking back as a more experienced programmer, you mentioned a little bit ago that you had used or you tried to use Haskell to mm -hmm. like do something um, that you played around with the Scala stuff and like where you were trying to get things done with these languages and they were difficult to um, like the learning curve was high. Mm -hmm. I think is kind of what you were getting at. So now as a more experienced developer in your talk, you advocated for things like 
um, reaching out to junior developers to hire them. And I'm assuming within that process, like mentor them and bring them along. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that both of those ecosystems have um, a lot of library options. So now, now as a more advanced programmer, like, do you think that, um, like, look, looking back, did those library are those libraries new, like within the time frame that you have grown as a developer? Are there like, are, are basically, I'm asking, like, if you were you, however many years ago that was. Mm -hmm. um, would your learning curve have been as high? Would the, are there more tools today to teach Haskell to figure out how to do something with it? Um, same thing with Scala. Yeah, yeah, I think there definitely are. Um, I think uh, you know there's more options today, and that could initially be confusing. But so like in you know some of the context was like you know I was in college and I had a senior project that I had to do. It was specifically it was working with uh, NASA JPL, and they had a uh, data collection system that they needed to uh, translate a bunch of different subsets of the data into different uh, uh, spoken languages. And so we had to write, it was effectively a web service that read in a whole bunch of different, uh, it, was, it was like climate data and uh, translate some of the metadata into these different formats. And um, there were like, you know, some more advanced requirements around how it needed to be translated and some of the new formats it had to go into. Um, but like at its core, it was a web service. And um, I really struggled to build something out in Haskell. I couldn't find many I couldn't find much documentation. Some of the documentation that I had assumed that I had a background in category theory that I didn't at the time, and I probably still don't. Um, or at least I, I, I don't know if I consider myself qualified enough to be that great at it. Certainly not enough to mentor someone. Um, but I think it is definitely a lot better today. I think a lot of people in the Haskell and Scala communities have poured a lot of effort into making their library, like even if the libraries existed back then and they were hard, just making them a, a bit more uh, accessible. And um, I think a lot of that is really good. And I don't want to you know, try to minimize that effort because it's, I personally think it's really critical work. Um, I think more energy could be spent on that though. And uh, that's where I think that, you know, you brought up mentorship. I think that's, that's where it really comes into play because when, when you are an expert in your programming language, you have blind spots that you've developed. Right, things that would be really hard for somebody new to pick up are just not that hard for you anymore. And uh, very oftentimes, you just sort of you forget about that. And if you have someone who's brand new and has never seen this stuff before, they just start asking all of these questions. That's when you sort of realize, oh yeah, this is kind of confusing. And it's 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 good in a work environment to acknowledge that and help somebody out. But I think, uh, you know, if you're the author of a library or just some other component that sort of has that characteristic, then there is additional work involved in trying to make it as accessible as possible. And, you know, trying to like find people who don't have much experience with the language that you're helping out and saying like, Hey, please find the most confusing parts of this for me. Uh, and, you know, we'll work together to try to make it a little bit better. It's, it's, it's hard work and you know, this is, this is something that like, you know, I personally need to do a lot more of on the libraries that I maintain on the F sharp side. Uh, there's, you know, some outdated documentation. You know, one of the things that I maintain is kind of a weird API with like, I wouldn't call it hard, but it's got like, you know, two ways to do the same thing. And I, I don't think that's good enough for, for beginners. And so, um, but like at the same time, you know, if I spend a bit, if I spent like a weekend improving the documentation and guidance on the website for this library, uh, it's a charting library, um, and just said, hey, this is the API that you use. And you know, they might see the other API that kind of accomplishes the same thing, but at least if they see the docs that says this, this is the way that you should use it, they'll probably get there. Um, so yeah, I think my long-winded answer to that is things are better. Um, they could be improved and I think, uh, you know, deliberately improving them in some of the ways that I suggested could probably make a big difference. Um, so somebody asked, how can we strike a balance between those simple X movements and adopting useful language innovations? For context, I realize that there are some very advanced and complicated concepts in Haskell for example, that are very research focused, but I also disagree with Go's approach of ignoring some very useful abstractions like generics. 
Oh boy. Uh, see, well, this is something I struggle with a lot because um, I am uh, a one of the decision makers on uh, F-sharp language design. And so as much as I'd like to say, do it the way that we do it, uh, I, don't, I don't quite know the answer to that. Uh, I can definitely tell you what we, what we do is we, um, we try to be as thoughtful as possible about how generally useful something is to people. And that can be a bit of a trap because if something is sort of by definition extremely generic, then you could sort of argue that it is generally useful to people. But um, really one of the things that we ask for is when people first of all make a suggestion for a language feature is we ask for a concrete example of how you're gonna use it. Right. We don't just want like we don't like it, it. We don't normally accept features if we just see a code snippet where it's like, OK, this kind of cleaned up this sort of abstract contrived piece of code here. Um, but we're much more likely to accept a feature that we would actually want to do if we can see like, you know, oh, hey, here's how I'm building a web app today or here's how I'm building this tool that does this specific task and if I have this feature that does it this way I can change my code to do this and these are the reasons why it's better. Uh, that is sort of where we try to drive discussions around language evolution and I think that's something that helps language designers because when you're in the middle of designing and implementing language features like you know like for example we're releasing F sharp 5 today uh, sorry not today uh, later this year uh, in the fall. F sharp five, depending on how you look at it, is gonna have like 10 or so new features. It's quite a lot. And from our perspective, when we're releasing things, we sort of view each of those features equally, right? Because it's about the features in the system that we're you know, producing an artifact of that we're gonna ship out to people. Uh, but how people use those features is very, very different from the way that we perceive them. And so uh, we try to put ourselves in the shoes of everyone who's, um, who's gonna be using them before we ever think of incorporating something. Uh, and the way that we, the things that we emphasize are very you know, practical in the sense of like, here's this specific library that I'm using to perform a task and inter interfacing with it sucks in this way. Uh, if we had this feature, it would make it suck less because of these reasons. And here's an example of what the code would look like if I had this feature. And this is sort of what it might imply. Uh, I think that's the line of thinking that we might want to try to encourage more in terms of language evolution. Um, I don't have a good enough view into the Scala and Haskell language evolution to really have, like I, I don't really know how that process works over in those in those spaces, um, so I can't really say concretely what you would do. But I would certainly say, like in the abstract, the more concrete, the better. I think from the perspective of getting um, more more adoption, and I, I totally agree that like you know the GoLang approach of saying no to everything by default, and you know making people bend over backwards as far as they possibly can to like let you even consider a single feature being added to the language which is definitely not the way to go about it. I think it's probably somewhere in the middle. Okay, um, so somebody wants to know, will F sharp get type classes and will .NET get simple Haskell? It's a good question. Um, so uh, will F sharp get type classes? Well, it's interesting because currently there are some things that you would normally try to accomplish with type classes today that you can actually do just fine with uh, some features in F sharp. And so um, that's sort of a, an interesting thing to keep in mind. Uh, the, on the F sharp specific side of this, uh, the challenge is F sharp language design. There, there's actually a wonderful paper written by Don Syme, who's the creator. It's called the Early History of F sharp. It's in, it was been accepted in the History of Programming Languages conference, and so um, I encourage you to read it. It's like 75 pages long, so it's rather long. Uh, but um, there's quite a few. Uh, there's a very good retrospective at the end from his perspective, where he said that he had a history of adding things to the language and the team at the time had a history of adding things to the language that the, the general .NET ecosystem didn't have yet. And so then they added something and it worked great for a time until eventually the .NET ecosystem, including C Sharp, started adopting maybe not that exact same thing, but something that accomplished the same goals that this thing does. And it created 
an incompatibility because there were ways that things were done on the F sharp side that couldn't just be ported directly into C sharp, couldn't just be ported into the .NET runtime. And so then from the F sharp language design perspective, they now had to deal with another way to do it, right? We saw this, we saw this happen in F sharp with async um, and then the task of T abstraction in .NET. Uh, F sharp came out, had tuples long before there were tuples in the C sharp language. When C sharp decided to add tuples, they made the decision that it would be a value type instead of a reference type. But F sharp tuples were already reference types. And so to be able to interoperate with C sharp tuples, F sharp had to add um, value type tuples, uh, value tuples. And, and they're, they're just different. And um, this is a challenge. And I think we've seen that happen enough that with type classes, we can't get into that situation because it would be too expensive to dig ourselves out of. Uh, I know that the C-sharp team is interested in type classy sort of things. Um, and because they've ex explicitly expressed that interest and had a few design meetings around you know, what some of that stuff might look like, we're very hesitant to start doing any work on our side because a nightmare situation would be is if, if we added F sharp type classes and then literally one release later on C sharp that had their own, like, I don't know, air quotes type classes uh, that accomplished a lot of the same goals. And then we'd have a whole bunch of people saying, hey, why don't you work with these things? And we'd say, oh, well, you know, we decided to build our own thing. Um, F sharp has followed along with C sharp and .NET very, very closely, sort of intentionally from a design standpoint. And that's sort of why. Um, why they're not being why they're not being added yet? Um, I think they'd be good to add. I think there'd also be a challenge, which is that the .NET based library itself had it never had type classes, and so just the way that things work in .NET is not like really conducive. Like the way that equality works in .NET is not the way that you know equality works in Haskell, for example. Uh, the Haskell equality is defined via type classes. It just sort of like flows naturally from that. Um, that won't exist in .NET, and so there would have to be sort of a different way of viewing the world when type classes are involved, which um, when we start to unravel it, we're, we get a little spooked, honestly. So that's, that's kind of it. OK, so kind of as an offshoot, I think, question from that one was, does F Sharp and .NET support proper and correct tail calls yet, otherwise known as tail call optimization? Yes, so it depends. Um, if you, so like there, there's ways that you can write um, F sharp code, or that, that rather that you have to write F sharp code. And yeah, it is, it is a proper tail call, it uses tail call optimization. Um, and you know, it'll, when it compiles down, it, it unrolls it into a loop and you know, it's all good to go. And, and that's uh, the pretty standard patterns for doing that. Um, you can get a little fancy with continuation passing and uh, uh, that sort of stuff for some more advanced cases, but you know, by and large, you can you can do it. Um, trivial recursive functions are not always going to be proper tail calls. Um, I think it's just sort of a design choice that was made in the compiler at the time. Uh, a key thing that is missing from F sharp though is being able to. Uh, identify when a recursive function is going to be tail call, um, is, is going to be something that we can perform tail call optimization on or not. Um, that's where I think the, the next set of work in that space is going to be going because um, I don't know if we can necessarily revisit the approach to doing tail call analysis and extra, sorry, uh, tail call optimization today. Um, but I think there could be work done to identify cases where we know that something cannot be optimized and then at least let the programmer know and maybe suggest an alternative. Okay, um, somebody had a follow-up question um, or was more interested in, in a additional part of the answer. So um, he had asked, will .NET get simple Haskell? Oh right, yeah. I'm I'm sorry for for missing uh, missing that. Um, my long-winded answers keep leaving things out. Uh, well, .NET gets simple Haskell. I don't know. Uh, I don't think anybody on the Microsoft side is going to be implementing Haskell for .NET. Uh, I know that there was a Haskell implementation for .NET at one point, and that would have to be revamped. Um, since .NET is entirely open source, I don't think there's anything preventing 
you know, the incredibly hard work required to build that out. But I also think at the same time, there's, there's no appetite, uh, certainly from Microsoft engineering to, um, to add a Haskell for .NET that, that would, you know, you know, be scoped down to you know, a, a simple Haskell. Um, yeah, that'd be my answer for that. All right, thank you. Um, so C Sharp is getting more FP features over the years. Um, does or doesn't it make F, position, F Sharp's position weaker in comparison when it comes to attracting new developers? Do you have some thoughts about it and what can be done to mitigate it? That's a good question. Um, and I think this, I think this question, this question can actually also apply in the Java space as, as Java starts uh, looking at these, these kinds of features as well. Um, specifically for the C sharp stuff, uh, on paper, there are some things coming that, you know, are very functional programming oriented. And, you know, if you look at like a feature by feature checklist, there are a lot more similarities, right? You know, eventually C sharp is probably going to get a form of union types. Um, it may take a while, but you know that'll probably happen. It'll be incorporated with pattern matching, and so th that is sort of a valid question of like, well, if I can do union records and pattern matching in C sharp, why would I do it in F sharp instead? Um, because you know C sharp has better tooling. It's uh, you know much more mainstream language. I'm going to be able to find more programmers if I'm a you know person who is hiring for C sharp. That sort of thing. Um, the defaults of the language still matter. Right. If you want to do immutability in C sharp, um, you still got to work for it a lot. And that's probably not going to be changing much unless they were to do a massively breaking change. Um, I think in terms of new programmers, it's a, it, it, it's a problem, but it's also an, it's an opportunity. Like it's sort of what I, what I mentioned before is, is I think there's going to be a lot of difficult conversations in the C sharp community and probably also the Java community about OOP versus FP. And like, how do we consider this language that's trying to do both at the same time? Um, and I think F sharp, you know, if you want to do functional programming, F sharp is just, it's better suited towards it because the language defaults are there for the, the style of programming that we, that we want to encourage. I think the same thing is true for Scala and um, for Clojure as well. If, you know, they're very different language with very different approaches to FP, but, you know, for what we typically consider FP, um, they're, they're better suited to doing that sort of stuff. And so I think it, it falls on us, you know, those of us who, who like these languages to very, um, I don't want to say like loudly, but like kind of loudly, but also not in an obnoxious way, advocate for doing things in a way that, you know, they, doing things in a language that was designed for what people are trying to do. Um, I think if we don't do that, Right. If we just sort of sit there and say, okay, well, we're going to accept, we're going to assume that people are going to see these things coming into languages like C Sharp and Java, and then um, assume that they're going to want a better language, then I don't think we're going to get many people jumping over. We're going to get a small subset who, you know, is uh, familiar enough with how this stuff works to understand that, you know, some languages do things better. But uh, I think it's going to fall on us to actually. Um, advocate in a way that encourages people to look at what's going on in C Sharp and Java and say, this is cool, I'm glad you're doing this, but I want to do it in a language that was designed for it. And so that's, that's sort of my, um, my, my overall thing. And that's like literally something that, like when I say we, I also mean like literally me, part of my job is going to be in thoughtfully encouraging people to use F Sharp in a way that doesn't necessarily diminish C Sharp, but also allows, you know, just has some important recognition about how if you want to do FP, you got to use an FP language, or like you should probably perhaps use an FP language. How do you feel about F Sharp becoming a training language for C Sharp moving forward? F Sharp becoming a training language for C Sharp. Um, I don't feel that much. That, I don't feel too much about it, uh, largely because like I. I mean, you know, it's not like, you know, we're in separate universes or anything with the C-Sharp team. Like, you know, prior to COVID, we were all in the same building. And so I had lunch with some of these people every day. Uh, you know, the people on the C-Sharp compiler team, you know, don't be mistaken. Like, they know programming languages. They know what they're doing. They understand a lot of the stuff that we understand. Uh, 
they're very thoughtful about what they do. They talk to me a lot about it. Um, I don't, yeah, I think like superficially you could say that C sharp is, uh, sorry, F sharp has been kind of like this, uh, this training ground for certain features to then later be incorporated into C sharp. I think that's a very uncharitable way to look at things that, you know, some people, mostly in the C sharp community will sort of parrot online. Um, I think most C sharp programmers don't even feel that way uh, in actuality. Um, I think it's, it's worth trying to shift the discussion, right? It's not, it shouldn't like, we shouldn't be discussing these things as a mainstream language, you know, strip mining features from another one because it's not really how it works anyways. Uh, I think discussions should be shifted towards the nature of a language, right? Like the, how it feels when you're using it. What are the defaults? What are the things that it typically encourages uh, when, when you're doing things? Um, because that, that's where I think you get into concrete differences that like, you know, you know C Sharp, for example, is never gonna be immutable by default. And that's just like one thing, immutability, but that informs everything about how you write your code. Like, and, and so, and if you wanna do that in C Sharp, it kinda sucks. And yeah, it's gonna get a little bit better with record types, but like, it's not gonna be that much better. Uh, the same thing is gonna happen in the Java community. And I think the Scala folks probably, um, you know, we're gonna have a challenge to sort of shift the conversation about like, you know, not, you know, what, what this feature means, what that feature means, but you know, what, what, what does it mean to program in Scala in a particular way doing concrete tasks um, versus what it means to do that in Java and why it's better to do it in Scala. That's, uh, I'm trying to encourage more of that on the FSharp side with some folks in the community. Um, I think it's gonna be an ongoing process though because I, I don't really have the answers for how to you know, approach conversations like that. Okay, well, thank you for, um, <laughs> somebody just mentioned, thanks for you know, going a half an hour over to answer all of our questions. <laughs> we definitely appreciate it. And I think it was, a valuable discussion and um, we definitely appreciate all the um, the the great depth of F sharp knowledge that you personally bring to this conversation. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you very much and thanks for everyone for sticking around. I'm sorry I, I did go over by like at least five minutes of my talk but uh, yeah I figured I'd stay for some for some questions uh, after going it's over. A, um, it's a guideline. Um, What's one of our one of the hugest advantages I think we have for the global edition of being an online one talk a week format that we get we have the freedom we're not as worried about ending right on time and so I'm enjoying that aspect of it right here right now yeah yeah this is this has been pretty great um you know I'm not gonna lie I was a little nervous I I, was, I get like I was I was extra nervous last year at Lambda Conf because you know I mean like a, a lot of people in this community they're not like the community that I normally engage with like I'm mostly in the F sharp community and there's a lot of non F sharp people here so I was a little nervous but hopefully it went okay and I'm definitely really happy to be here um and yeah. certainly appreciative of all the support and the you know the, the comments I'm glad that people were you know, you know engaging with some of the things that I had to say and uh, yeah, had a good time. Yeah, well, thank you again for being here and um, thank you for those of you who stayed to the very end and um, we appreciate you coming out and joining us with our webinar today. <laughs>